Thank you so much for all coming this evening. Uh, my name is Katie O'Donovan. I work in the Public Policy Unit at Google in the UK, um, primarily looking after economic policy. And it's fantastic to have you all here today. I think Mariana and I first started talking about this um, in July. I was going to say when it was sunny, but actually it was a really, really rainy day. And um, we thought it would be a fantastic idea to get together and talk about women in industrial strategy. And we weren't quite sure, I think, how, how, how much we knew that that would be a good idea. But it's really fantastic to see so many of you here today. So thank you very much for coming along. Um, I think one of the things that we get asked quite a lot as Google um, is, you know, what do we have to do in the UK to make uh, be a UK Google? And often that seems to be people's sort of byword for kicking off any kind of conversation about the industrial strategy. And we th thought, I think, when we were talking about the industrial strategy, that often another perspective is missed entirely. And whether that's just the viewpoint of 50% of the population, or whether that's actually what we are seeking through the growth, what is the purpose of the growth that an industrial strategy um, can provide, we felt actually it's time to kind of pause on the very obvious question that we sometimes um, get to answer, which we actually spend a lot of time thinking about. I know very keen to answer too, but to think about that wider perspective as well. And so we've got a fantastic panel here today. Um, I'll introduce them all properly as they get up to speak. Um, each of the panellists is going to talk for five minutes and then we're really keen to have a, a good Q&A session where people can ask any of the questions that um, we want. And I think everybody today will really talk about the industrial strategy from their perspective. And one of the things that I would say if um, I was going to talk for longer, which I've cunningly devised a scheme that I don't have to talk for longer, <laughs> is um, how we think about education in all its forms as part of the industrial strategy. So for a lot about what Google does and a lot about how people are able to use our products to really grow their own personal economic well-being or to contribute to the nation's well-being being is about the education to develop those products but also the skills to use them and to really fully utilize them and so some of the things we think about and we invest in are really high quality secondary education in computer science through to having the best universities in the UK but also other routes into um, computing and engineering careers and so we've been working on things like apprenticeships to actually recruit men and women through that process and then thinking about how we really make lifelong learning something, I think um, Kate and I were talking briefly earlier, that isn't sort of everyone admits, yeah, skills is a great thing, but actually you have some real excitement, real investment and real dedication behind that. So those are some of the topics that I hope um, that we will uh, talk about this evening. But first and foremost, I want to invite Mariana, who I think... It's a cliche, but needs no introduction. But um, when I first started at Google, lots of us in the policy team were avidly devouring Mariana's book, not always agreeing with every uh, sentiment in it, but finding it a really, really fascinating challenge. And it's, it's fantastic to see you doing more of that work at UCL and to join us this evening to kick off such an interesting debate, I hope. So Thank I'll you. pass over. Great. Well, thanks so much. Yeah, one of the chapters was about Google needing to pay more tax. <laughs> anyway, we won't go there. That's not, about, that's not about that, is it? Anyway, so, and I think you also very delicate, delicately missed the real story of how this all began, which is there was a launch party for this wonderful headquarters where there was a bicycle, one of these bicycles that move, or don't move, you move, and it doesn't move there. And we had all drunk a bit, maybe too much, and got on this bike and started talking about interesting things. And one of those things was, let's do an event together. And it did come quite naturally that Google being seen as you know, one of these high-tech companies where all across Europe, people are like, oh, why are the Googles and the Apples always in the US and not enough of it in Europe? The whole question of, is that because of the lack of venture capital or the lack of an industrial strategy? And the book that I wrote, The Entrepreneurial State, was all about how the US actually talks like Jefferson, but acts like Hamilton. <laughs> and the problem is that when you don't talk about what you're doing, you also then don't have a learning and sharing of experiences, which also means learning and sharing what goes wrong. This isn't about some sort of rosy story of the kind of Silicon Valley model. But I think the context, sorry, I had my iPhone here because I was going to time myself, so I'll make sure I go. Only Jesus Christ. Um, the context of this event, which is about industrial strategy, having not just, you know, not just being about infrastructure, but actually about being a, a particular type of innovation and directing the economy in a particular way, is coming at a very exciting moment because industrial strategy, after years of being basically a bad word and a blasphemy, is back. 
and how to get it right as opposed to just making it a trendy thing where people kind of nod at dinner parties and say, yep, we got to do that, we got to do that, and actually make it something that in some ways becomes a thorn in the side of many of the types of policies that got us in the wrong place in the first place is, I think, what we should almost have as an ambition. You know, make this an uncomfortable conversation. This should not be a comfortable conversation. The first point that should make us all uncomfortable is that the kind of growth that we've actually had in this country, as well as in the US, but definitely the UK is one of the worst on this, has not been investment-led. It's been consumption-led. And that consumption has been through debt. So people like to talk about public debt as being a problem, but private, oh God, is that you? Good. There's no way that I'm done with my time. Please, she's told, get these Google people, they can't deal with tech. Just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, what was I saying? Yeah, so going from a consumption-led model to an investment-led model actually requires a framework. But quickly, consumption-led growth gets us in trouble, it actually gets us the financial crisis. So the rate of private debt to disposable income is back at record levels. It's back at the, rec at, at the levels it was just before the financial crisis. So people having to take out debt, credit cards, et cetera, in order just to stay the same in terms of their living standards is a problem. And of course, that's a result of real wages not having increased for the last 20 years. Anyway, if we want a different model called investment-led growth, and if we want that to be through things like innovation, innovation-led growth and industrial strategy, we have to admit that both economic growth and innovation have not just a rate, but a direction. And what I see this conversation about tonight, this nice intimate sofa type setting, and please do come up and sit here if you'd like to, Indian style. My 14-year-old daughter is here with two of her friends, and they're probably the only ones who can sit in Indian <laughs> style, but please do come here so I can tap you on the head. Um, is about you know how do we actually use industrial strategy to do more than just feed sectors. We have very low investment in the UK, as with other European countries, so you don't just say to industry, oh, here's a life sciences strategy or an automotive strategy or aerospace or creative industries. You ask these different industries to transform themselves, first of all, by investing, for example, and not being ultra-financialized, as many industries are, increasingly using things like share buybacks, as opposed to reinvesting profits back into the productive process, but also perhaps to work together across sectors to solve problems, right? So you don't think about industrial strategy in terms of serving a sector, whether it's the creative sector, automotive, or financial services, but industrial strategy to transform an economy by tackling what you might call missions or problems that are really relevant to that society. And what we mean by missions, I think, is quite important because we shouldn't confuse it with challenges. Challenges are quite broad, they're really important, they kind of drive the vision, right? So you might talk about inequality and climate change, these are challenges. Then a very narrow thing is something like a sector. So renewable energy is a sector within, you know, that obviously has to be tackled to address the climate change problem. But a mission is a problem that actually might, that is driven by trying to address a challenge, but might require lots of different sectors to work together to solve. So going to the moon, the most classic mission, right, that lots of people think about, the Apollo mission, actually requires something like 12 different sectors, including clothing, not just aerospace. And the energy vent mission in Germany, which is really interesting, I encourage you to look at it, has not just been about renewable energy, it's been about transforming the entire economy through a very concrete mission, which is the energy of an emission of zero carbon emissions across sectors in a, given, in a limited amount of period, which has caused, for example, the steel industry, which is often described as a mature, boring, kind of inertial industry, to transform itself. So steel in Germany, unlike in the UK, has massively lowered its material content through repurpose, reuse, and recycle. And that has required innovation to transform itself, and it has been rewarded for doing so. So this is not about SMEs as sort of some sort of blanket you know, category, or innovation, or infrastructures digging ditches and filling them up again. This is about having a plan for a country to transform itself. And I'm soon going to hand over to Sue, because I think whereas we have thought a lot, at least in some of the quarters that I delve in around green missions, like the one that I just mentioned in Germany, the Energy Venn mission, care 
itself could become a direction through which to define certain missions. And green should be a direction through which to even think about the transformation of IT and steel. Green as a direction for the whole economy, which would require also green infrastructure, so not just building roads and bridges and shovel-ready projects, but green as a direction. And I'm gonna hand over to Sue now to talk about care as a possible you know, other way, a complementary way, to think about directionality in the economy. Thanks, and if I can just you. introduce Sue. Um, Sue, if we're delighted to have you join us today, is a professor and feminist economist at Open University, and also one of the founders of the Women's Budget Group, which does really exciting work around the budget. So, Sue, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you, well, very nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about social infrastructure. Um, we have a very clear notion of physical infrastructure, of shovel-ready projects like um, Mariana talked about. But there's also a very important aspect of what we all depend on, which is, which is social infrastructure, investment in health, education, <coughs> training. It's in the systems of those that matter. So we, I, we talk about it in, sorry, sorry. We talk about it as investment because it's for the future it's spending now in order to have gains in the future. And it's infrastructure because these are public goods. They're things that benefit more than the direct recipients. So what I mean by social infrastructure isn't just the buildings in which training or education or healthcare goes on, but the systems themselves, the systems of healthcare. The NHS is part of our social infrastructure. Um, and we can think of it a bit like physical infrastructure and then it produces something, it produces a stock of something, sometimes called human or social capital, that gets used up and is used for the benefit of the population. Of course, restricting the notion of infrastructure to physical infrastructure produces a huge gender bias because who do you, who do you employ to, produce, to build bridges and who do you employ to build a care system? Research by the Women's Budget Group, of which I'm a member, and led by Jerome, who's sitting over there, has shown that nearly twice as many jobs are created if you invest the same amount of money either in construction, which is the normal notion of how you do stimulus spending, for example, or you invest them in care. You'll get about twice as many jobs from investing in care as you do in construction. And that's not only the direct investment, but also the indirect invest, the indirect jobs that are, that are created in other sectors, and then the induced employment that comes from the spending of the money by those um, workers employed, either directly or indirectly. And of course, investing in care, and in most sorts of social infrastructure, improves the gender employment gap, while investing in construction undoubtedly worsens it, unless one puts in very careful mitigating um, employment policies. But another difference, investing in care in particular, and, and possibly some other aspects of social infrastructure, pays off even when there's already high levels of employment, because that's because it actually creates the labor, labor supply too. So unlike building a building, which might employ existing workers. If you invest in care, you create, you expand the labour force and create the potential for what Mariana is very keen on, and I'm less keen on, which is growth. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I'm keen on is recognising the need for economy and for society for high quality care. We do get some notion of that, uh, the idea of investment with respect to childcare. There has been a, an increasing talk of investing in our children, investing in our future that way. But if you take social care, the care of people with disabilities, and particularly older people, usually it's only talked about in the, in the, under the heading of cost containment. <laughs> it's the only sector which is universally talked about in terms of how can we stop it costing too much. And that's where I would go along with what Marianne said. We need a mission to improve things. So 
We don't only want, and this is very important, to provide care from the 1.3 million people who are not getting the care that they need at the moment, but also to improve the quality of the care that we all get. What we've had with respect to social care has, has been a care system crippled by a failure to invest and a counting of immediate costs, a failure to understand that it's something that we should invest in. And what we've had of that is we've produced absolutely useless, low-quality care. And to change this, we need two things. We need new forms of delivery. What we do know about care and care quality is that care that is motivated by the profit motive produces rubbish care. That doesn't necessarily mean that all private sector producers produce rubbish care, because a lot of people who work in the private sector actually have a lot of other motivations too. But we really need to think innovatively of new forms in which care can be delivered. In particular, I think cooperative forms of organisation that recognises that providers and receivers of care have joint interests. They, they, aren't, they aren't like a market in which the suppliers and the, those people who demand it are completely distinct. Their interests are common and they could work together, they could have cooperatives in which both sets of stakeholders take place. They have joint interests in producing good quality care. The, what are the conditions of work for one are the conditions of care for the other. They're effectively the same thing. But instead what we've had is short-sighted cost cutting that's led to a bifurcated system of domiciliary and residential care. So we've had a very short-sighted focus on costs have led to people thinking that domiciliary care is what everybody needs. It, it, it is, in fact, of course, what many people want, given the options that are currently available. But these options are not the only possible ones. And, of course, there are some economies of scale in care. So domiciliary care is not inherently cheaper. That's the reason we've had so much focus, is because local authorities and governments don't want to spend too much on care. It's cheaper to keep look after people in the home. But it's only cheaper because some of the costs of care don't need to be paid for by the state. So, for example, rent or the unpaid care that's been given by neighbours and relatives. These costs are paid for, they're not, they may be free to the state, but they're not free. Those costs are paid for by others. So this is a very irrational system that some, some costs are counted and some are not. The result is that residential care has become only for those with very high care needs. And therefore, it's not desirable for anybody else or for themselves or for those people themselves. It's really become a place that nobody wants to be. And, of course, that magnifies the difference in costs if only the very, those with very high needs go into residential care. So what do we need instead? We need a whole range of care options between staying at home all the time or being in full-time residential care involving different forms of provision and different forms of housing. So this is, like Marianne talked about, missions cutting across sectors. This would cut very, very carefully, clearly across housing and what counts as social care now. And we also need a, a different attitude to ageing. So old people are not to be seen just as dependents. First of all, they do a lot of caring themselves, and they certainly pay taxes. Better health care earlier on would enable many more of us to be fit and productive in old age. There's quite a lot of evidence on that. An ageing society is not necessarily a problem. Instead of bemoaning its costs, we should be looking for ways to make sure that it, that it isn't that as people age, they continue to be able to... Sorry, I've got that wrong. <laughs> we should be looking for ways to make sure that as people age, they, they first of all, they continue to be able to contribute to society, but also that they are supported and given whatever help they need to be able to do so. Thank you, Sue, so much. We're now um, going to hear from Kate, who is joining us from the TUC. And Kate heads up the uh, Economic Research Unit at the TUC and um, is going to share her perspectives with us. Thanks, Katie. Um, and thanks for the invite to this really lovely event in a really nice venue. <laughs> it's very nice to be here. Um, so I thought I'd talk very briefly about 
how we see kind of the purpose of industrial strategy. And I guess Mariana and Sue have talked very much about some of the social problems that we need to solve, kind of what we're trying to do when we go to work. But I guess from the kind of the TEC's perspective, one of the things we think an industrial strategy I'm Sorry, for the teenagers in the room, there's three, it's the ah, trade union council. We're the trade union congress. <laughs> we represent 52 <laughs> unions across all sectors of the economy and over 5 million people from who do everything from social care to nuclear scientists to pretty much any job you can think of in between and I guess what we think about is jobs and when we think about a purpose of an industrial strategy um, we put out a report last week which was called great jobs in great places and what we're really trying to say is how can we get better jobs for everybody that should be the test of is our industrial strategy actually working um, it's pretty clear that we're not there at the moment and um, we've had real wages falling for the last five months um, the average wage still isn't back to its position of where it was before the financial crisis so if you think you know why might people feel a bit fed up well their <laughs> wages are still where they should you know back where they were ten, not yet back to where they were 10 years ago um, we've got about one in 10 people working in insecure jobs so whether that's a zero hours contract it might be some form of insecure agency work or it might be low paid self-employment one in 10 people who probably don't have the security of knowing when they're going to work knowing how much they're going to be paid and perhaps knowing whether they're going to get a pension and of course it's women who are bearing the brunt of this kind of poor jobs problem um, we have the figures on the gender pay gap um, it's still I think at the rate it's closing at the moment it won't be closed until 2056 um, we have more women in those insecure jobs than we do have men and of course we have a lot of focus in our own campaigning as well around for example uber drivers the warehouse workers at sports direct but we hear quite a lot less about care workers about teaching assistants and about hospitality workers and those are the areas where actually insecure work has risen the fastest it's not really in the gig economy it's in traditional jobs where employers have just sought to cut costs and of course we know that nearly one in four women are low paid compared to just one in seven men and I think we need to think a little bit on kind of when we're thinking about sectors and we of course we need to work cross sector but it is sometimes yeah. helpful to take a kind of sectoral perspective and I think some of it is just because of how we value the jobs that women do so the low pay commission set out this thing which they call low paid industries and I sort of knew this was the case but thought I'd just go and check that this was the case before I came to talk today and seven out of 11 of those are dominated by women so women make up just under half the workforce and in all of those industries which are mostly low paid women are making up more than the average amount of women in the industry and I think if you think about care work and how we value it which is very much about what Sue was talking about we also pay it much less and we also, it's not just that we don't pay these people properly, we also don't train them properly either. So the Joseph Roundtree Foundation did some nice research in 2014 and they looked at retail catering and care jobs and that's half of all low paid jobs in the economy. And they found that workers in lower level occupations and on part time or temporary contracts are less likely to get training, less likely to get opportunities to progress and workers in these sectors were particularly less likely to be receiving training. In retail they were about as likely to be receiving training as everybody else but then they looked into that and that was induction because the turnover in retail is so high that they're needing to spend training you know saying this is how the tills work or this is what you say to somebody when there's an unexpected bagging item in the bagging area again and again so all their training is dealing with their staff retention problems so we've got low pay in these sectors we've got low training and both of those are bad for progression and of course they're really bad for productivity as well I think it's quite interesting, the OECD, which is an economic think tank, which looks at developed economies, <laughs> to explain all my terms, um, published a survey, an economic survey of the UK just last week. And they were really pretty scathing about our very low level of productivity and our very low level of skills. They pointed out that low-skilled workers in the UK participate less in training than high-skilled workers. They pointed out that our skills performance is much worse than most other European countries. And they pointed out that pretty shockingly, young people are almost as likely to be low-skilled in the UK um, as older people. So in most countries you say, okay, we didn't used to be very good at training, but as we go down the generations, we're getting better at it. One of the things the OECD points out is that's not actually the case in the UK. And they also actually, quite radically, for what's normally quite a conservative institution, said 
actually um, poor quality work, including zero hours contract, is really bad for Britain's productivity. And productivity is the word you probably hear most often in association with kind of industrial strategy, but not very often in saying, well, why is our productivity so weak? It's because we're not paying people properly and we're not employing them on decent terms and conditions. And that's particularly the case when it comes to women. So what do we actually do about this? Um, well, we think we should probably start thinking about where I came into this discussion and actually think about the quality of jobs. Um, we should probably, often industrial strategy says, let's focus on our kind of high-tech, exciting sectors. And of course, there's a role for that. But we think actually we should be focusing on some of these low-paid, low-tech sectors where actually, again, when we look internationally, some of our productivity gaps, so why is the UK doing worse than other countries? It's these sectors which actually help to explain why we're falling behind. And again, we think we should use some of the tools that we know work. Actually looking at some of our high productivity industries, so you look at the automotive industry, that's a sector where they do invest in their workplace, workforce, they train their workforce, they listen to their workforce. The Automotive Council works very closely with trade unions. They have the voice of their workforce very much involved. And I think that's very far from being the case in some of those sectors we're talking about. So our kind of key thing, the key message we're trying to get across when we're talking to the government about industrial strategy is actually, one, you need to start in the kind of less exciting bits of the economy. <laughs> loads of people work in retail, loads of people work in care. They need jobs and we need to improve the quality of those jobs. And actually you can look at it a positive way and say, well actually, because these jobs are really pretty crappy, we're not training them, we're putting them on bad quality contracts, there's loads we can do. We sort of know how to fix this and we could do it. But also nearly all businesses will say our workforce is our most important, our workforce is our most important tool, you know, this is what we most invest in. They talk like that, they don't really recognise it. We've got some of the, we've got I think the sixth lowest level of worker participation in the EU, in the UK. Companies in the UK are not good at listening to their workforce, they're not good at hearing what they have to say and we do think there's much that the government could be doing about that. So when we talk about these missions, where are we saying, how's the workforce involved in them? How can they contribute to that? What are the ideas from the shop floor where they can contribute? When we're looking at kind of sector deals, if we are going down that road, where's the workforce involvement? Are unions engaged as they have been in the automotive mm -hmm. industry? And I guess we also think that if we're listening to the workforce, we're much more likely to be listening to women too. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kate. That was fascinating. And now um, to our final speaker, Rania. Um, so Rania Leon Turadi is a director at Bayes, which is now we're testing acronyms now, <laughs> Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. So named because the strategy is so important, which is fantastic. Um, and Rania is a director of business growth there with um, a lot of input into the industrial strategy. And she is also the gender champion at um, Bayes. And I think anyone who works with her can see what a powerhouse um, she is. And so it's fantastic to have you joining us today, Rania. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katie. And hello, everyone. I am delighted to be here. I must admit, I came for a glass of wine and I found myself speaking. But. Uh, <laughs> You can see how, uh, how well I will do at the end of it. Uh, I think some of my colleagues are already holding a board up to mark me as, uh, you know, one out of five. Um, uh, so thank you very much for inviting me. It's uh, great to be here and I'm delighted to hear all the things that I think that our industrial strategy is going to uh, address. So um, let me start by the blasphemy question. I completely agree with Mariana. This is what uh, the world used to call the, the word. This is what uh, exactly it was. But uh, I think that we're hoping that we have proved so far and we will prove when we publish the strategy that is not anymore a, a blasphemy. On the contrary, I'm hoping that the industrial strategy will be able and definitely will do so, uh, address and create, help us all create the economy and the society we want to agree in, to live in. Um, and why am I so confident? Well, for five very good reasons, which I think are the foundations of our strategy. I want to tell you a little bit about our foundations. I want to tell you a little bit about how the strategy came together and what it's hoping to do. And then I would like, as the last speaker, to open the floor in helping us, trying and inviting you to help us design the strategy. It's not published yet and is not the end. Uh, the publication is not the end. So let me just say a little bit about um, how we got here. Um, you all know that we announced the development of an industrial strategy almost, uh, how many months ago? Probably about a year, yeah? 
Uh, and uh, we published the Green Paper and invited a lot of people to talk to us. And indeed, you'll be surprised, but quite a lot of people talked to us. And you'll be incredibly encouraged to hear that a lot of the groups that talked to us were not only uh, your average uh, tech people or, you know, uh, deep industry people, but also there were quite a large number of women groups. So I took the topic of the conversation today quite literally. I want to talk about women and I want to talk about women and industrial strategy. So you'll be reassured to hear that we have a very long list of those that responded back to us. Um, so the aim of the strategy is to create the society we want to live in, to create the economy we want to live in, and we want to make it an inclusive economy. And I think a lot of uh, m my, my fellow panelists talk about how closing the gap, how making more inclusive economy actually increases the value of our GDP. So how are we going to do this? We're focusing on five key areas, which I think are quite important. And they're not um, areas just for men, they're not just areas just for the rich or the poor or et cetera, but they are hoping to be areas that will address quite a lot of the, uh, of the, of the things that we want to see manifesting in the economy. The first one is business, and I'm very passionate about that. As uh, Katie said, I do lead on business growth in the Department for Business Energy and Industrial Strategy. And what that means is I care and my remit and the work inside the strategy is to focus on productivity, is to focus on how we grow those businesses, how we take them small and we enable them to scale through, how do we enable them to actually fulfill their owner's dreams as well as the day-to-day -day lives of the employees that they actually employ. Um, so business is quite hard, it's quite, uh, it's the core of the strategy and you will see it hopefully coming through as one of the main themes on, uh, on how we, we are planning to, to, to work through um, uh, with our, our stakeholder groups and others to, to develop some of propositions there. Followed by that, of course, is skills. So we're looking at people and the skills and the ability of those skills to drive and create a more productive and a more inclusive economy. I'm glad that we've brought up the productivity problem uh, and the productivity issue. I'm told that um, uh, normal people, as opposed to economists, um, <laughs> when they hear the productivity word, they switch off. Uh, and they consider it boring and all of the rest. Um, and in order to prove that, we helped, and it was announced a, a few months back, we helped create a body that it is owned by the business, dev dev devised by the business, called actually Be The Business. And that body is supposed to focus on productivity, supposed to enable businesses to understand simple things, simple opportunities of how they can actually grow their productivity. And it's not really complicated questions. It all comes back to something you're all very familiar with. Do you have systems in your workplace that actually enable your employees to fulfill their dreams and their potential? Do you have leadership? Do you focus on leadership and management, which is some of the core things that actually make what it is uh, the make or break of a business? Um, so skills and people will be quite key. It's quite key and, and quite important. The third foundation is innovation. Um, I think my team gave me a bit of a, of, a, of, a, of a list of the kind of things that we have done and why makes the UK a really important place in, in the world and what are the key strengths. And one of the things that we do focus about and we always talk about is something that a lot of my panelists know very well, which is the strength of our universities, the strength of our research and the strength of our innovative capacity. And we have put a significant amount of money in that in the last year or so, over £4.7 billion money in research and development in, in the UK economy. So innovation will be key, will be centre, but it will not be a sector focus event. It's not just about the techies, as you called them before. It is about how do we drive innovation, as a, how do you use innovation as a driver to actually motivate and enable even the smallest and the most uh, simplest businesses to actually grow and to increase their productivity. There is a theme that is developing through that. You can probably hear me sort of saying it, and uh, I have not been able to actually articulate it as, uh, as, uh, as, as clearly as um, uh, sometimes we hear some of our uh, colleagues uh, across government say that. And, and what it is, is the really one of the key themes of the industrial strategy is to boost our earning power. And pillar one, two, and three, looking at businesses, looking at skills, looking at innovation, we're hoping that we'll be able to drive some of that earning capacity, ability to close gaps, ability for people to have meaningful lives and also to earn the money uh, that, that, that they, they deserve. 
Last two areas for where we will be focusing on is place. Uh, it's quite important to ensure, and what research and what we have seen through talking to people is any of our initiatives, any of the work that we do should be done close to where people live, where close people live and work. And we've heard quite clearly that building businesses, being able to do that effectively, is based on creating and being able to sustain yourself through your local networks. How do you actually create the ability to, to live in a place that enables you to grow your skills and grow your capacity through that, through that place? And the very last thing, of course, is infrastructure. How do you develop a physical and digital infrastructure that enable us to create the economy of the 21st century? So if these are, if you like, the five foundations on which we're hoping to build and develop our industrial strategy, what is really important for us is to ensure that we hear from every one of you. We are able to uh, understand what are the fine ideas, what are the, the, the important things that can drive the development. The strategy is not a piece of paper that will stay on, on a shelf. It is not the end and all and be all, but it is a process. It is something that will enable us to continue the dialogue with many of the business uh, groups around, with many of our um, uh, colleagues, with many of our citizens of this country to help us to drive and continue to maintain the momentum that we start. So see the launch of the strategy as it's coming before the end of this year as the beginning of a very big and large conversation in this space. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there's, I'm just looking for the other microphone, which hopefully can make its way into the audience. Is someone? Uh, do oh, you have sorry. the microphone? <laughs> if you can pass that on. Um, we've got about 15 minutes now where we can take questions. And I think, um, in particular, feel free. I know often at these events, people have to you know, ha they have a really important point they want to make and they dress it up as a question. I think actually tonight we've, we've heard you can just make your important point and, and not pretend that it's a question. Um, so um, I think to keep things um, moving, I always think though shorter points are still best. So I take points, interjections, questions in three and then I think we'll go to the relevant panellists um, and I think there'll be some discussion within the panel as well. So if anyone wants to put their hand up or if you might have a question yourself, that works perfectly. <laughs> we Convenient. can start there. Thanks, and if you want to, please do tell us where you're from um, and it's always helpful to kind of hear the perspective that the question comes from. Great, thanks very much. And thank you so much to the panel. It's so inspiring to see a panel of such fantastic women. Um, so I'm Grace, I work for the Institute of, for Public Policy Research, uh, IPPR, not IIPP. Um, <laughs> <yeah. laughs> um, and we're currently um, doing a programme uh, on, called the Commission on Economic Justice, which is looking at the kind of structural issues of the UK economy, and Marianne is a, a commissioner on that. Um, and we've been doing some research ourselves into the UK's productivity problem and how industrial strategy can kind of combat that. Um, and we've kind of found that the, the problem is down to a long tail of unproductive firms in the foundational economy. So that's the kind of real economy, as you were, you were talking about, kind of um, hospitality, care, work, retail, those sorts of things. Um, and the, a large part of that productivity problem is down to the quality of, of jobs. Um, so unsurprisingly, people who like their jobs tend to work harder. Um, and this is a metric upon which the UK performs particularly badly. Um, so the greatest issue we really have is uh, bad jobs in low pay, low productivity sectors with um, businesses who've built a model on extracting more from an increasingly precarious workforce. Um, and so we argue that the UK needs to focus on uh, an industrial strategy that focuses, focuses on good jobs. Uh, so jobs with uh, high levels of autonomy, of diversity in day-to-day -day roles and good options for progression. Um, so I'd be really interested to hear uh, from, from all of the panel about what they think industrial strategy can do to promote these kinds of good jobs. Fantastic, thank you. Do we have uh, another question there? And there as well, so <laughs> sorry. We'll come to you in a second. So to relate to the social infrastructure, I'm um, from construction project management at UCL, uh, working in infrastructure financing basically, and I actually am wondering how to make it attractive for the institutional investors to, to invest in infrastructure, not just the government, in social infrastructure. So one, one idea, just throwing it um, boldly, would be, uh, since the biggest part of the institutional investors are pension funds, one way to, to kind of um, convince them is, um, uh, is because it's a social infrastructure and we are the ones who are invested in the pension funds, actually we can change our, our future. So, but I think the problem is really that many people are not even aware that they can 
actually put pressure on the pension funds and how those pension funds are investing and maybe we we all of us can can change that and by just being more transparent where pension funds are investing great thank you and there's a guy there if we can pass it over <laughs> Hello, um, my name's Jake Sumner and I work at Respublica, a think tank, uh, sorry about that, another think tank, and uh, leading on industrial strategy. And I did work on industrial strategy for the Labour opposition for a number of years and worked with Kate on that. Um, I suppose, uh, and a little plug, a report's coming out on industrial strategy on food and drink tomorrow. Um, so look at that. But the question, I, or the point and observation is, uh, Kate re uh, mentioned low productivity sectors, lack of uh, uh, employee voice. Maybe there's a way uh, to, uh, to the Bayes representative to, to think of how to put that in sector deals um, and have employee voice deals through that to raise productivity, particularly those sectors we've talked about where there's a um, large amount of low wages, insecurity, uh, uh, and women being the brunt of that. Um, but also, I'd also say, Mariana has taught eloquently at many, many occasions about mission orientated, uh, about missions, we heard some of that today. It's how, I, I would also say how we embed that in key sectors, and the food and drink is one of our bigger sectors, it's 400,000 people, and um, bigger if you could include agriculture and restaurants and the rest of it. Um, healthy and sustainable foods really as needed, uh, uh, but our innovation ecosystem is not geared up for that. Only 10 million quid is spent on that um, through Innovate UK. So really, how do we work with industry to set that? And again, putting back to the government, uh, the, the, the government on that, because I think there's a real opportunity post-Brexit to think how we can uh, how we can use our sectors to, to, to achieve better missions. Fantastic, thanks. And maybe we can start with that question, because I think... Um, What's interesting, and I think if you take the, what was kind of summed up in your question is this tension, or is there a tension really between the sector deal approach and the, the very kind of clear stages that you set out in industrial strategy, which I think are really interesting and useful to hear, and then the kind of passion and the request from Mariana and Sue for this mission orientated approach. So um, I'm paraphrasing slightly, but do you feel, Rania, there might be a tension between the sector approach and the mission approach? Do you feel um, they can uh, they can be combined to be resolved? I don't have a no, sorry. There you go. Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think they could absolutely be uh, combined, but I want to take, I know we want to start from this question, but I want to start a little bit further back because um, you raised the, product, the point of about productivity. And one of the things we hear quite a lot that cuts through a lot of our, what you call sector deals or the missions, etc., is understanding some of the reasons of why we have a very unproductive uh, part of, uh, of economy. And that is, we have a very long tail, as you say. Quite a lot of the findings and the studies that we have seen is based on exactly the same issue, which is how do you actually manage leadership and management. So quite a lot of the emphasis on creating leadership and management skills inside the organizations is one of the routes that could potentially, one, increase productivity, but two, also address some of the points around the sector deal. How do you actually manage some of the uh, sector versus missions and how the firms can maximize their potential? What I would also say is there has been very little experimentation around in, of how, not only in the UK, but also across the globe, on how you use technology, how you actually diffuse different parts of technology, how do you use the basics of technology, and we're not talking AI, we're talking about basic skills in terms of how do you do your accounting, how do you do your HR, and this is some of the parts that are holding back uh, a significant number of the tail. And another myth is that the tail is not only on the small businesses. There is a tail of productivity that cuts through across every single size of business. So while we're looking at productivity, while we're focusing on those cutters, cross cutters, there are issues that cannot be ignored at the same time as looking at the missions. You cannot think of a mission of any country, of any point, or any kind of um, event without considering what is the capability of delivering that mission. So I don't think that it is impossible to come. I don't think that looking at missions and looking at sectors is incompatible, but what I'm saying is there is a fundamental issue of looking how do you create a more uh, productive economy and how do you actually create an economy that has more earning power that can help you combine those two. So 
I would agree with everything, Rania, that you said, but I think, again, coming back to my earlier point, that we should be at least a bit uncomfortable, and if we're not uncomfortable, we're not doing our job, because actually this isn't happening, as much as we'd like to say it is. I think that the five issues that you mentioned are really important, but I would put them in a category, um, which is a useful category, it's a good category, but it's kind of horizontal conditions. Right? So of course we have to invest in skills. We need to think about infrastructure. We need to make sure that the economy is balanced in terms of north and south, so you know, pay attention to place. But unfortunately, this often gets interpreted in terms of different ways to kind of level the playing field, when actually this kind of mission-orientedness, which is very much at the core of this institute we've set up at UCL about thinking of purpose, so strategic direction, consciousness within policy is about tilting the playing field. Now, usually when we talk about tilting the playing field, people get worried because it's about, oh no, don't pick winners, don't pick that technology, don't pick that firm. But of course we have to pick. Everything we've talked about here is about picking. The question is how? How do we pick in such a way that provides a direction for the economy that is not leveling, it's tilting, but at the same time it enables and it nurtures bottom-up experimentation, exploration, trial and error, and innovation. And, it, and it's not enough to talk about those five things, even though those five things are central. So I think the, the debate here is about what do we mean by vertical policies, and how do we get these vertical policies, not just the horizontal policies. By vertical, I literally mean the choosing, the direction, the consciousness within governments, to be enabling and not sort of stifling, not top down. We know that doesn't work. It didn't work in the Soviet Union, and it won't work in capitalism, it won't work in communism. Neither one can deal with sort of top down directional stuff in that static way. But that doesn't mean that vertical has to be that way. So that's where the sector mission thing comes in. So if we define problems, right, whether it's around climate change, whether it's around care, it doesn't mean you don't talk about sectors. It's not about sector or problem. It's about, and, and we've passed out these great leaflets that took us a huge amount of time to create, so please do read them, but changing the vocabulary. It's not about picking winners or not, it's picking the willing. Pick the willing. There's actually few companies, to be honest, we've done quite a few studies on this sectorally, that are even willing to engage in these missions. You need to reward them. And the whole long-termism thing shouldn't just be, you know, short-termism short -term is bad, long-termism is kind of good. How do you actually reward long-termism? And this does come also down to corporate governance. We haven't heard that word yet. I'm surprised, actually. I mean, I'm, I know the TUC <laughs> does talk about it. Yeah, corporate <laughs> governance matters. And this whole issue of skills, where do skills come from? They don't fall like manna from heaven. They don't just come from training programs of governments, as much as that is important. They have, up until basically the mid-1980s, also come from companies. You know, when profits are reinvested back into human capital, a word that you know, is, some people have problems with, but let's just call it human capital, as well as physical capital and production and R&D and training programs, skills are endogenously created through the investment process. When profits stop to be reinvested in that way, due to different issues around financialization, you get a reduction of skills. You will not get innovation-led growth without also tackling corporate governance issues. And I know that TUC has been very concerned about this. We've written quite a, you know, a lot about this. Lastly, the issue about deals, you know, when talking about tilting the playing field and picking the willing, this is about you know, deals. You know, patents are deals. Patents, somehow, we've all talked about them as IPR, right? The R is rights, as, a, as other God-given rights. Patents are contracts that need to be negotiated. They've been incredibly badly negotiated in the innovation landscape. How? We are allowing the tools for research, so upstream at the beginning, to be patented. That didn't used to happen. We used to patent downstream. If you patent the tools for research, you block science. So the irony is that in a world of open innovation and big data, we're actually going back to the Middle Ages in terms of secrecy. And that's not because it has to be that way. We've stopped having the proper kind of negotiation and deals around the contract. So getting a more healthy public-private partnership, the sexy word everyone likes to use, partnerships, an ecosystem, we have to make sure those ecosystems are symbiotic and mutualistic and not parasitic. 
And one of the goals we have in the Institute is by rethinking public purpose and public value is to give confidence again <laughs> to actually to civil servants who see themselves, not just businesses. I think it's more common in businesses to talk about purpose. If you talk about mission orientation, directionality and purpose in the public sector, it also increases your confidence to also negotiate these deals in such a way that reaches that public value. Yeah, I was going to do that. And I think it might be a good time to bring in Grace's question as well and talk about the, uh, the, the good jobs and what they look like. Sure. So two kind of thoughts and kind of responding to Rania a bit. So one is sometimes we act as if we're only grappling with this question in the UK, basically, and we kind of exist in a little bubble. Whereas we know even when we look at UK firms, foreign-owned firms are much more productive. And some of the reasons behind that might be they're better managed, they have traditions of consulting their workforces. Um, if you look at our big automotive firms, you know, often foreign-owned, very productive, they unionise, because that's just what they do normally in Germany, you know, one of the most productive <laughs> countries. That's normal for them to... And we know that good management comes from... Listen, anyone who's a manager or has ever had a manager, which is pretty much everybody, knows that listening to your staff is basically the key thing you do if you're a manager, and good managers are those who actually pay some attention to you. So putting the structures in place where you do that is really what makes the difference. And I think we can... You know, maybe we could just look at our foreign-owned firms and say, oh, look, they have long-term <laughs> governance arrangements. They have worker representatives on their boards. They have, you know, voting rights for shareholders who've held shares for a longer period period of time, oh look, they're more productive, maybe we could learn something from that. So I think that's, that's one point. But a bit picking up, I think there's kind of, if you listen to kind of, just listening to Mariano a bit and thinking, what are we saying? And Grace's perspective, we're kind of saying, you've got to kind of raise the ceiling a little bit, you know, be more ambitious, but you've also got to lift the floor, basically. And, you know, I think some of the discussion about industrial strategy when we started talking about the TUC and we started saying, well, actually, what about jobs in low-paid sectors? Some of our colleagues were saying, that's not what industrial strategy is about, you know. <laughs> that's, that's something else. That's your insecure work agenda. We're like, well, it kind of is what industrial strategy is about because this is where most people work. And the kind of missions and high-tech, which will kind of bring productive investment into the economy, which will expand our productivity, which will build social purpose, are vital and brilliant and great, but we can't forget what Grace called the foundational economy or Jake's talking about in the kind of food and drink industry, which maybe isn't going to solve climate change, but will, well, could contribute to it, to it I guess, but will also, um, you know... Sorry, why do you say, so missions in theory would be really only climate to transform. Why do you go back to this high-tech, low-tech thing? Yeah, maybe... Yeah, maybe, I mean, maybe, I don't think, I'm not saying they're mutually exclusive, but sometimes when we get into the conversation about just the way the conversation happens sometimes feels like we're going to talk about mission and we talk about sending someone to the moon, and that's great, basically, but we don't, uh, maybe I don't understand, you know, maybe it's a failure of understanding how the mission then cascades down to the person who is social care, maybe it's easier to see, improving the conditions for the social care worker who's delivering that or improving the way, maybe the way we use technology to deliver better retail services, but thinking about how it tra transforms the whole economy sometimes feels like it's not quite there in the conversation, and that's probably me missing it, but it would be great to kind of have, have that. Fantastic. Sue, yes, I was just going to hand um, over to you. I'm conscious that none of us have addressed the point yet about um, how we use our power as investors and how we can make the most of our power and how we Oh, well, I wasn't, going to talk, I wasn't going to talk about that, I'm afraid. Um, but the, the point that I'd like to make is that in, the, in low productivity sectors, or sectors that are called low productivity, um, because there is obviously an issue about how you actually measure it, um, it isn't necessarily that you're trying to abolish the sector or to have fewer workers in it by raising productivity. And in particular in care, I think we shouldn't be seeing it as trying to reduce the number of care workers, but to be able to get them to produce higher quality care. And that that's exactly what training um, and the use of technology can do. There's been a lot of, a lot of talk about, you know, how could we get <laughs> robots to care for our grandmothers and things like that. There's, I think there's, qu there's quite a lot of scope for the use of technology and care, but it's not to replace people, it's to augment them, it's to make them into more productive workers and give them better jobs as well. I, what my aim in all this would be, to, would be to make care a sector in which people will be proud to work, 
that they wouldn't be say they wouldn't be the sector that a dis, you know steel workers end up in because they can't get any other any other work but something that people are, are proud to be in where their their own creativity is used to improve the condition both their own working conditions and the quality of care that they can they can provide of time do we we do have um time for two or three uh quick interventions and quick responses from the panels as well if uh jake if you could pass the mic on there thank you, thank um, you. we've got two hands up i'm there stephanie as well. griffith jones uh i work uh, i'm emeritus at sussex at ids and i work at ipd columbia um i have two very quick questions the first one is about institutional investors which was asked before and i think there is a, a interesting issue uh, which we've discussed with Mariana about how to attract private investment and the role that governments and public development banks can play uh, and give guarantees and other support to the private sector, make it attractive, but on the other hand, not go over the top because what the private sector often wants is all the guarantees against the risk but keeping all the profits. And the idea is that we have to also protect the public resources, which are taxpayers' resources. So that balance, and there's often, uh, when we talk about public-private partnerships, there's often uh, many people have estimated that these projects can be actually more expensive to the government than, um, than pure public investment. So I think we have to be very careful. And secondly, if I may very quickly, um, there's an interesting discussion about sectors. I've just been reading one of Danny Roderick's latest papers, and it's very much along Mariana's line in another way. He describes Asian success as both increasing productivity within sectors, but also moving to the high productivity sectors. So although I'm very sympathetic to all the stuff about care, as one gets less young, particularly so, but so how do we conciliate that? How do we conciliate the search for high productivity that a country like the UK has to have in its industrial policy with the need to also encourage sectors like, like care, which are important? I mean, or do we think about them more as employment generation and providing of key services, and then we leave the, the more dynamic productivity increasing sectors to these more uh, high-tech sectors where we have cutting edge, we are more competitive, we should become more competitive internationally. So that, that's, I think, an important dilemma. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think there was, uh, there's lots of questions. So if we're tight for time, basically you'll get less time to have a drink on your way out the longer you talk. So it's, it's a true test of your commitment to the issue. If we very quickly go, um, everyone that's got their hand up, if you just want to say something for one minute, if we can just pass the mic around. There's someone behind you first. Thank you. Was, yeah, one, ten seconds. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, I represent Ethical Trading Initiative. Well, that's what I work for, but speak on my own. But what I wanted to make a point is about public sector as a driver for change in terms of how overall economy uh, works. So one actually question what we are trying to address now is how through uh, public procurement, public sector can actually lift the standard, how, you know, how the affordable workers are treated through uh, all the way through the supply chains. At the moment, that's really not being done, uh, but as we know, public sector has a really massive uh, purchasing power, uh, you know, uh, so there's a big influence and in how we can use this innovative thinking in this area. Great. Okay, I think we're going to take okay. that and then I'm going to, there's a lady down at the front in a purple jumper, if we can pass the mic forward. Um, Thank you. Um, I'm Maureen McIntosh. Um, I'm an economist who works on health and issues. Um, I, I wanted to make a point about social, social investment, um, social infrastructure. And it seems to me that if we're trying to think how you link up um, sectors, how you think across, then housing and the construction industry is absolutely central to trying to transform care. That the way in which, I was trying to think about the supply side of it all. And the way in which housing gets designed and built, the way it's funded, the way it's thought about, is absolutely nothing to do with care. But actually, if you did it differently, you could transform the way in which the living relations and care relations work and the jobs. Fantastic. Thank you. So two, four people there. So <laughs> really quick inter interjections. And then there's a couple here. And then we'll do 
one minute from the panel each. Fantastic. Thanks. I'm Sarah Chaita, Director of Research Strategy and Policy at UCL, but this is actually more of a personal question, which is if we take a challenge to be gender inequality, then what is the mission or what are the missions that the industrial strategy can deliver to address that challenge? Um, I'm uh, from the Greater Lincolnshire Local Enterprise Partnership, and an area like mine, um, the, the idea of inclusive growth seems quite compelling until you realise that it's largely focused on cities and looking at those areas. And, and uh, so I've been quite interested in how an area that isn't yet growing can think about inclusive growth. I think some of the answer might be around Mariana's point about bottom up and us as an area thinking and redefining that for ourselves. But I'd be interested in views about that. Fantastic. If you can pass, oh, yeah, that's one, two, sorry, a go. Very quick question. Um, I'm a former world banker and management consultant, and one of the key constraints I've seen in the past to effective industrial policy is that you don't really have private sector people in the public sector who understand what companies are after. So what can we do uh, to tackle that? Hi, my name is Ivana Vatteletti. I'm the chair of the Fabian Women's Network, although my day job by work in privacy law and uh, data protection. Um, I have a question. So how do we reconcile all this, that we're fantastic, that we we're talking about this evening, with two main things? The first is Brexit and the fact that we might end up having to be a deregulated economy to compete globally. And the second is how we reconcile with the digitalization of the economy and the radicalism that probably we probably need to deal with the loss of jobs, but also with the fantastic opportunities that digitalization or artificial intelligence, machine learning will bring to our economy. Great. How are we going to do all of these in one minute? We'll be fine. <laughs> right. okay. and her, uh, hi, I'm David Bent. I'm at the Institute of Global Prosperity at UCL, amongst other things. Um, I'm really inspired by Michael Young, who in the 60s, seeing the rise of individualism and um, of consumerism, created the Open University and the Consumer Association. So my question is, what are the institutions we need to tilt the landscape so that we have a successful UK in a sustainable world? Thanks. Is that the last question from the floor? Fantastic. Oh, no, one more, one more. <laughs> I won't actually offer too much of a question because you're never going to be able to answer all these questions <laughs> in one go. Um, I'm Rowan Conway. I'm Director of Innovation and Development at the RSA, but I'm also a pub landlady um, in my... I own my local pub and operate it. And I just think it's um, an important... It's been a very important leveller for me as I talk about policy, and especially place-based policy, and thinking, talking about low-paid sector, where uh, we are a living wage employer, even though we can't afford to be a living wage employer, we work with people from the local, you know, one-mile perimeter of our pub, and we struggle to get by, and we may well go out of business. You know, when we talk about food and the low-pay sectors, I think we also need to get really real about the ecosystem that surrounds us, and why it's so hard, and why pubs go out of business. Routinely, 22 pubs go out of business every month in the UK. Um, why those things are in place. So I would really like, and I, you don't have a chance to answer any of these questions, but similarly to the question there about gender and what does a mission look like, if we're trying to talk about low pay, low wage, low productivity sectors, you know, how do we get real about that? And then what does a mission look like? You know, so we're talking about the challenge of low pay and those, those big sectors. What on earth? How are you going to address that? And how does a pub landlady get involved? <laughs> That's a great, a great challenge and a, a great question to end on. So I think I'm just going to try and summarise. So we, the last one was how does a pub land uh, get involved? What is the mission um, that we see for the industrial strategy for gender? How do we do growth where there isn't growth necessary at the moment and it's not in a city? How do we solve Brexit and the economic consequences <laughs> of that? How do we bring private sector expertise into the public sector and vice versa? How do we get investors um, to think responsibly? And public procurement, how do we use that as best practice? So I guess if all of you can take your favourite from those or the thing that you think you have the, the most to add on um, and have a really quick, snappy response on that, I think one thing I've taken from that is that there is an, a huge amount of debate and interest and desire for answers to this, which is fantastic. But I'll let everyone have uh, their final say. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to pick just a few. Um, high tech and low tech. 
I think the care sector is a wonderful example of where that can be, those two can be combined. I think the, the, the fact that, you know, the notion that anybody can do good care is, is clearly wrong. Um, there are lots of very exciting technologies at the moment thinking about ways of, ways of improving care. And I think that we really do need um, an innovative way of thinking about how to get different sectors talking to each other around there. Housing, of course, is, the, is in, if you like, the obvious one for another sector that needs to be combined with the care sector. I have to say it's a long-term thing, thinking about that. And there are so, I think there are some more short-term areas where, um, where we, we might have some sort of shorter, quicker gains on that. The guy from the Institute of Global Prosperity has just, your, your, in, your institute has just produced a report about universal basic services. Yeah. Very nice idea. Didn't include care. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why not. <laughs> um, I think that's about as much as I can. So I wanted to take the issue of business. There's two, two or three questions on that, both institutional investment side as well as the World Bank person who said, what does business want? And I think what's interesting is if you actually listen to some of the lead investors, including Warren Buffett, and I can tell you he's not a communist, but he often says things like, why did you reduce my capital gains tax again? <laughs> I don't even look at that. I invest when I see an opportunity. And much of what we're talking about is, and if we want to focus on the care bit, is how do we transform care from a cost to an opportunity, to an opportunity not you know, for innovation, for cross-sectoral collaboration, for an opportunity for investment. And business does follow. They might talk tax, Pharmaceutical sector is famous for talking about tax, you know, the patent box tax policy, which is a really stupid tax policy, but they follow, they walk where these public investments are. So the role of well-structured, strategic, patient, mission-oriented, direct, not indirect, meaning tax incentives, uh, public investments has often been, in fact, to create endogenously these animal spirits that Keynes talked about, the willingness to invest, the perceptions of where these future opportunities are. So that's the first huge point. <laughs> um, the second is, what should those opportunities be? Which is, again, what we've been talking about. And really, I, I just think this is such a big agenda. And, and let's just take this at the next event, workshop. Hopefully, this is just the beginning. Let's call it an aperitivo, literally, to something longer that perhaps we can do throughout the whole year to continue to be a thorn on the side of the industrial strategy in a productive way, a productive thorn. <laughs> but you know, how to really transform this care area to do the kind of things that Maureen was talking about, housing, but also digital. I've always been struck how the whole digital agenda, again, has a direction. And we've chosen to use things like big data for things like personalized medicine, but not the welfare state. The bedroom tax, just think of what the bedroom tax was in a world of big data. It was the most simple, ridiculously kind of dumb algorithm. It was not anything about complexity science. It was, you know, how many bedrooms do you have? How many kids do you have? If one is bigger than the other, you're out. <laughs> and without any, any analysis of the big data that obviously we have about the families living in those places, I mean, this, I'm gonna put this very bluntly and rudely, but we have lots of data on poor people. We have very little data on rich people. <laughs> we could be using the data we have on low-income families to enrich in their lives, to improve the welfare state, to improve care. We've chosen not to. We use it for personalized medicine that has these profit opportunities. So again, this all comes back down to this whole issue of not just the rate, but the direction, and this whole conversation here is about how to debate that direction, how to how to affect that direction while also enabling, again, not stifling innovation and competition, but we can't get there by not talking about the strategic choices that are out there and having a strategic choice around care as an intersectoral, innovative agenda, which is about a social infrastructure, I think is really incredibly exciting. And I definitely think we should have a part two of this event. <laughs>
Thank you, Mariana. I would just say something very quickly because I think the, the mission or the passion that I think would be particularly relevant for a company like Google to see and to help tackle issues like Brexit and also the digitization channel is really through skills. And I think that companies like ours can and we do invest in creating digital skills for communities in all places of the UK, but actually when government can convene businesses doing that, we can achieve much more than we can on our own. Um, I'm now going to pass on to Kate very briefly. <laughs> okay, so thank you for all the really interesting points, which I cannot possibly respond to all of, but I have definitely learned loads from listening. Two really quick ones. Um, what institutions do we need? Um, we need institutions where other people in their workplaces can have these conversations about what we're doing. For us, those are trade unions, but we need to think very, very hard about what trade unions look like in an age of digitalisation, in an age of Brexit probably, but I do think we need institutions where other people get to have this conversation too. Um, in terms of the kind of, um, what, what would be the mission to tackle gender equality, it is just going to come back to how we value care. And I think going back to look at what are our low paid sectors, basically they're sectors which involve looking after other people or doing things which have typically been done by women. And I think the kind of question of valuing is really interesting. And I'm always struck by this thing someone who used to work in the Treasury said on a panel once, where she said, we can cost the cost of a nuclear submarine. And basically we make it up. We've got loads of assumptions, but we don't really know its value. We kind of have an idea about you know, how it's going to depreciate into the future, and we've got a whole methodology for doing that, and we've worked it out. But basically, we've just put some numbers on a piece. We've agreed a methodology, and we've written those numbers down, and we all agree it. And we don't do that with things like investing in social care, with investing in childcare. And again, it does sometimes feel it's because it's like it's a bit too female. Yeah. It's not really numbers-y, and we're not allowed to make up those numbers in that way. <laughs> and I think, like... <laughs> that might be our mission, you know, how can we make up the numbers? <laughs> Great, thank you very much. So I will tackle a couple of these things and then put one offer back to you. Um, the first one is about the low tech and the high tech and going back to something Mariana said, maybe we should stop thinking about low tech and high tech and think tech for a reason and also think about tech for an opportunity for a purpose. Because there will be a business that might need a low tech and there may be a business that need a high tech. And the same thing, we might need a mission that has a high tech. And I think we have been quite brave and progressive in the UK. Recently we published our AI strategy. We were one of the few, uh, or review actually, not a strategy, but the review that it was actually done on AI. Quite a lot of thinking, quite a lot of work and watch this space about what is going to come on the back of that on the industrial strategy. So I just recently travelled to Japan and Singapore and we saw what they're doing out there. We are very much ahead of starting to think. Somebody from the Royal Society even started to think about, you know, what are the ethics, what are the problems, what are the issues we're going to see ahead. So I think for me, what is really important and with something that will come out of this is not low tech versus high tech, but how do we use technology and how can we be proactive on the front foot to know, to know how we are going to incorporate it uh, into our economy. The second thing I would say is uh, funding, so quite a lot of questions about funding. There is a similar kind of uh, discussion that is happening with the Treasury. I don't know how many of you have you've been following that, but know that the Treasury is looking into the patient capital review. We're looking at new ways of actually funding what's the role of uh, pension funds and other vehicles in the economy. So I would suggest that um, uh, there will be uh, something that uh, it will, we will be able to uh, uh, the treasurer will be able to produce on the back of their consultation of that. So maybe one way of getting of getting involved. On the pub lady and getting involved, if I connect the pub lady with the other one, which is what is the inclusive economy and how we create a mission out of that. And this is my challenge to you, or this is my offer. Going back to what Mariana said before, yes, let's have another one of those. We do want to have another one of those. But maybe we should come together. Maybe you can put the mission or the offer or the sector challenge or whatever that might be back to us. Or what is that creates a more inclusive economy that has more women at its helm or more pub ladies? So uh, it is not just sector deals for the sectors and the verticals. But if we are going to create something, as I said, this is a strategy that will go on for a long time. It is not the end by the time it's published and we're open for having more discussions in this area. That's a perfect way to end. Um, and can we thank Katie? It's one of the least financialized companies. No, I'm serious. It actually invests lots of its profits into things like energy, which doesn't happen. I won't name your main competitors, but it is, you know. 
Thank you. And thank you. There's a couple of people in the room that have really worked incredibly hard to make uh, tonight possible as well. So thanks to all of your team and to our wider team too. And I think Rania's point at the end is perfect, that this is actually the kickstart of the conversation. I think I've been delighted at how interesting and vibrant and how much I've learned this evening too in this conversation. So thank you all so much for coming out. Um, and thank you to the panellists as well, because it's, it's been truly fascinating. I hope there's um, time for a quick drink on your way home, but thank you very much for making it up to King's Cross. Thank you.